A man is tossing bait into the sea, but the next second... Uh, your chum is terrible and needs to age a few more days. The blank truck... Snapping back to his senses, the man hurriedly rushes back into the cabin to tell Captain Quint about what just happened. Upon hearing the news, Quint immediately perks up. He rushes out of the cabin to take a look, only to see a massive shark still circling nearby. As the great white shark approaches the fishing boat, all three men are stunned by its enormous size. The shark is at least 8 meters long and weighs more than 3 tons. After confirming that it's the same great white shark that attacked tourists on the beach a few days ago, the three immediately spring into action. Today, they're determined to take down this beast and bring its body back for the reward. To prevent the shark from escaping, the experienced fisherman Quint rushed into the cabin and began assembling his harpoon. Once the largest harpoon is in place, Quint steps back onto the deck, harpoon gun in hand. He orders Brody to take control of the boat, while he heads to the bow to keep an eye on the shark's movements. Seeing the shark rapidly approaching, Quint urgently calls for Hooper to tie the harpoon line to the floating barrel. But at this crucial moment, Hooper fumbles, unable to tie the knot in time. The shark is now only inches away, and they're about to miss the perfect shot. Finally, Hooper finishes the knot, Quint immediately pulls the trigger, and the harpoon strikes the shark's dorsal fin with precision. The wounded shark began to thrash and swim desperately, instantly dragging the connected rope and floating barrel into the sea. The barrel acts like a tracker, allowing them to pinpoint the shark's location while also draining its energy. As the shark swims farther away, the three men quickly follow in the boat. However, they didn't expect the Great White to be so powerful, it drags the barrel down into the depths of the sea. With their target disappearing, Hooper and Brody grow nervous, but the experienced Quint remains calm. He tells Brody to stop the boat. Once the shark tires out, it'll surface on its own. But this time, Quint miscalculated. They waited until nightfall, yet there was no sign of the shark. So, the three of them head into the cabin to drink and share stories from their pasts. They were strangers before, but this damned shark had brought them together. Quint shows the two men the scars on his body, proof of the many times he narrowly escaped from the jaws of sharks. Not to be outdone, marine biologist Hooper reveals his own scars, the result of being bitten by test subjects during his research on marine life. Only Brody, the police chief, quietly glances at a scar on his abdomen and says nothing, as if it's tied to a past he'd rather not recall. Finally, the three men, who had eaten and drunk their fill, even sang a cheerful song, but they didn't know that the floating barrel had already floated to the surface at that moment. Just as their spirits reached their peak, the boat is suddenly rocked by a violent collision, and all three men immediately sense something's wrong. They scramble to their feet, trying to start the engine and escape, but the shark launches another attack, causing them to lose their balance and fall to the deck. Meanwhile, the hull begins to crack, and water starts flooding the cabin. Fortunately, the fishing boat is equipped with a pump, so it won't sink right away. But they didn't expect that this great white shark isn't just smart it's also holding a grudge. Intent on getting revenge on the humans who wounded it, an enraged Quint grabs a rifle and heads to the deck, firing wildly at the shark. However, all his efforts are in vain. Bullets are difficult to hit targets in the water, but the frightened shark still scurries away. The three men finally catch a brief moment to breathe. At dawn, they waste no time and begin repairing the damaged boat. Unexpectedly, the floating barrel resurfaced, and Brody quickly informed the other two. They assume the shark has finally exhausted itself, so they immediately hook the barrel and start tying it to the stern, preparing to tow it back to shore. But just as they're pulling in the line, the shark suddenly bursts from the water, jaws wide open, though they narrowly escape the shark's attack. The line attached to the barrel is bitten clean through. Watching the shark swim away, Brody realizes that the three of them and this small boat aren't enough to take down the Great White. He heads into the cabin, deciding to call the Coast Guard for help. But just as Brody picks up the radio to call for backup, Quint storms in with a club and smashes the equipment to pieces. Brody explodes in anger, shouting, Are you out of your mind? Quint remains unfazed, believing that if the Coast Guard gets involved now, all his efforts will be for nothing, and he won't get the hefty reward. He's counting on that money to retire. As they argue, Hooper suddenly spots the shark turning back toward them. It seems the Great White, like them, has no intention of letting its prey get away. Quint rushes to the deck, shouting for Hooper to tie another barrel, then grabs the harpoon gun and fires another shot at the shark. Staff, that looks good.
The injured shark swims off again, dragging the barrel behind it, and the three men chase after it at full speed. The shark appears to be tiring, compared to yesterday, it's noticeably slower. The fishing boat quickly catches up, and Quint, seizing the moment, raises the harpoon gun and fires another shot, attaching yet another barrel to the shark to increase the drag and further sap its strength. This time, the shark is completely enraged, and it turns to attack them head on, just as the shark nears the boat. Brody fires several precise shots with his revolver, hitting the shark's body, wounded. The shark has no choice but to flee, dragging the floating barrels behind as it disappears beneath the surface. To their astonishment, even two barrels couldn't stop the shark from diving into the deep. But before long, the barrels resurfaced again. The three men quickly steered the boat closer and hooked the rope, tying the barrels to the stern. It seemed the shark was finally at the end of its strength and all they had to do now was drag it back to shallow waters. However, just as they finished tying the rope, the shark suddenly surged forward. The tight rope caught Hooper, pinning him in place. Fortunately, Brody acted quickly, freeing him in time. At that moment, the shark began thrashing violently, trying to break free from its restraints. Its immense strength nearly capsized the boat. Quint, refusing to back down, immediately started the engine, steering the boat in the opposite direction. His plan was to drag the shark ashore, but Hooper noticed the hook on the boat was loosening. Reluctantly, Quint had to stop the boat. Then, in the next second, the shark surfaced again, this time trying to bite through the rope with its sharp teeth. Sensing danger, Quint grabbed the harpoon gun and rushed over, firing another shot directly at the shark's jaw. To prevent the hook from coming loose, they tried to untie the rope, but unexpectedly, the shark suddenly yanked hard, pulling the other floating barrel underwater as well. The shark was now dragging the entire boat along with it. The rope was too tight to untie, and the waves crashing over the boat were starting to flood the cabin. At this rate, the whole boat was going to be dragged under by the shark. With no other option, Quint grabbed a machete, preparing to cut the rope. But before he could make a move, the hook could not withstand the strong pull and instantly came off. Though they lost the hook, the boat was saved. And now, the shark was hauling three barrels along with it. Quint confidently declared that there was no way the shark could dive with three barrels attached. But their relief was short-lived. As they prepared to pump the water out of the cabin, they saw the shark drag the barrels underwater and attack the boat from below. Seeing this, Quint had no choice but to start the engine and head for shallow waters. Since a head-on fight with the shark wasn't working, their only option was to lure it into shallow water and figure out a way to kill it there. But the shark, equally aggressive, followed without hesitation. Despite having three barrels tied to it, the shark's speed outpaced the boat at full throttle. Quint, however, was not at all panicked and kept the throttle fully open. What he didn't know was that the generator was already overloaded, spewing thick smoke. By the time they realized something was wrong, the engine had completely failed and exploded, and the fishing boat had also lost power and stopped moving. The shark, having caught up, slipped beneath the surface. It seemed the shark was preparing for another attack. They were done for. The explosion had caused more water to flood into the cabin, and the boat was slowly sinking. With the radio smashed by Quint, there was no way to call for help. Quint tossed two life jackets to Brody and Hooper, silently waiting for death to come. In this desperate situation, Quint noticed some equipment Hooper had brought along and asked him what it was for. Hooper explained that it was an injector, designed to deliver a lethal poison into the shark. If he could get close enough, he could make sure the shark wouldn't see another sunrise. He had even brought along a shark cage, though the plan was incredibly dangerous. Given their situation, they had no choice but to try. The three immediately began assembling the shark cage, while Hooper prepared the deadly poison in the injector. Once everything was ready, Hooper donned his wetsuit and entered the cage. Once the shark cage was lowered to a certain depth, he began searching all around for any sign of the shark. The shark, as if sensing its prey, swam toward Hooper, dragging the barrels behind it. But instead of attacking right away, it circled around Hooper once and then vanished from sight. Panicked, Hooper glanced nervously in all directions, when suddenly the shark attacked from behind, knocking the injector out of his hand. The injector sank into the depths, and the once sturdy shark cage was now severely deformed. Hooper, frantically searching for the injector, was hit with another violent assault from the shark. With the cage on the verge of being torn apart, Hooper summoned all his strength, fought back, and then quietly slipped out through the top of the cage. He didn't dare return to the surface, knowing he would be dead if the shark spotted him. He hid in a nearby coral reef, 
Watching as the shark continued to attack the empty cage, it was only then that the two men on the boat realized something was wrong and hurriedly activated the crane. However, by the time they had pulled the shark cage up, it had turned into a pile of scrap metal, and Hooper inside was gone without a trace. They didn't have time to wonder if the shark had eaten Hooper, because the shark suddenly leaped out of the water and launched an attack on them. The shark's massive body tilted the boat sharply, and both Quint and Brody lost their balance, tumbling to the deck. Luckily, they managed to grab hold of the boat and didn't immediately slide overboard, but an unlucky Quint had his hand crushed by a falling oxygen tank. Brody couldn't save him in time and watched helplessly as Quint slipped over the side. The shark had already been waiting with its jaws wide open. Quint never imagined that, after so many narrow escapes from the jaws of sharks, he would ultimately become their meal. Brody, though he had momentarily avoided death, now faced an even greater danger. The boat was sinking fast, and the shark, Having finished with Quint, came charging back. It seemed one human wasn't enough to satisfy its hunger. In a panic, Brody grabbed an oxygen tank and tossed it into the shark's mouth. The shark, which had not succeeded, had to retreat temporarily. Seizing the opportunity, Brody climbed out of the cabin. He knew the shark wouldn't easily give up on its prey. So he grabbed a rifle and a harpoon, then climbed higher up the mast, preparing for a final showdown with the beast. Suddenly, the shark launched a sneak attack. Fortunately, Brody reacted quickly, adjusting his position and striking back. He plunged the harpoon into the shark, but despite several blows, it seemed to have no effect, and the harpoon was soon pulled into the water by the shark. Now, Brody's only hope was the rifle in his hands. As the boat rapidly sank, Brody aimed at the shark charging at him once again. The final duel was about to begin, but the shark was too fast, and Brody's shots missed one after another. At the critical moment, Brody noticed that the oxygen tank was still lodged in the shark's mouth. One shot rang out, followed by a massive explosion, and the shark was finally defeated. Overcome with relief, Brody let out a triumphant shout. Not only had he survived the shark's relentless attacks, but he had also rid the town of its greatest menace. Hooper, who had been hiding at the bottom of the sea, finally dared to resurface, seeing that they were both still alive. They couldn't help but smile with a sense of victory, sadly. Quint had perished in the jaws of the shark. With little time to mourn, the two men grabbed the remaining barrels and began paddling toward shore.